Hello and welcome to an unexpected podcast. My name is Tim. And with me as always, we have Matt, Devin, Rainier, and joining us back again is Rob. Um, on this week's episode, we're going to be going over a list by Califas, as well as the main topic, which is fiefdoms list that we have all written to help you in case you were trying to take them to a tournament. We've all written, but Devin. Devin did not write a list. <laughs> I am too good to write a fiefdoms list. <laughs> he that. He doesn't need to go there anymore. He will, For those he will, of you... <laughs> he will not sully himself by writing a fiefdoms list. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who saw the last episode, you saw I was clearly the expert on the channel for the fiefdoms, so I felt like I should just watch the others, see what they come up with. In fact, Devin is still standing in the middle of a river trying to figure out what to <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, so we'll go to the list real quick, which is from Caliphas. All right, so here we have a list submitted by Caliphas. It is a yellow alliance at 798 points with 47 models, 8 might, 10 dwarf bows, and 4 elf bows, plus 2 ballistas and legolas. That's his lead-in um, to the list. For the first warband, we have a dwarf king. Um, it doesn't say what gear, so just dwarf king with 8 dwarf warriors with shield and 6 dwarf warriors with bow. For Warband 2, we have Flowey Stonehand with eight Dwarf Warriors with shield and four Dwarf Warriors with bow. Then we have two Warbands, which include a Dwarf Ballista with an extra crew. And the fifth Warband is an Allied Warband with Legolas Prince of Mirkwood with Horse, who is the leader of the force, um, a Mirkwood Elf with Banner, Shield, and Glaive, seven Mirkwood Elves with Glaive and Shield, four Mirkwood Elves with Glaive and, looks like, Elf Bow. Um... And he says that he wanted to run a ranged heavy dwarf list with Flowey, who can ruin the day of Galadriel or Shadowlord or the likes, and that he would love to hear our thoughts on this list. So my first thought on this list is that it seems odd to have chosen um, the Khazad Doom list for allying with Mirkwood as opposed to Iron Hills, where you would have kept that green bonus. Um, in terms of accomplishing his goals of having a lot of shooting, you definitely have that. You've got... Um, a whole lot of strength three bows with the elf and dwarf bows. You've got the two ballistas, which can set up on your flanks and shoot. Um, Flowey Stonehand, does he make everything a red alliance unless he no, is? No, he does not. And, and actually, I, I have to... That's a reason. Flowey is the reason he didn't bring Iron Hills, by the way. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because yeah, I then, figured. If, but... you, if you brought Iron Hills, it would be fun without Flowey. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've got lots of examples <laughs> of that. But... Well, he, he wants to shut down those R of the bubbles. Yeah. Yep. So... Um, yeah, because I know that if you take the Balin list, it becomes red with everything, but I didn't know yep. if Flowey could go outside of it. So. Yeah, it's, it's Balin that did it. I, I actually, uh, until I saw this list, I actually, I, I thought as you did that, you know, you basically took Flowey with Balin and that was the only option. <laughs> right. But when you read Flowey's rule, um, you can take Flowey as long as you don't take any other named dwarf heroes and it has no impact. You know, it doesn't change it from being a Kaza Doom list well, that's true yeah yeah that's, so, okay, well, that's clever then yeah yeah um i mean the I'm one sure thing a lot of people actually think that we probably yeah. taught everyone something new. yeah yeah <laughs> so. um well it, it, the only downside of this is that the dwarf warriors are still kingdom of Kaza doom warriors mm -hmm. so flowy doesn't get the benefit of um I can't remember what the name of the rule is. It doesn't is. change them to the Moria keyword? Is what you're... It does not change. No, Balin is what yeah. changes it to the Moria keyword. Um, so so there, he loses that a, rule, basically. Well, he, no, well, he still keeps his... Um, I, I can't remember which, which rule is called which. And, and, so Lore Master is the one that allows him to shut down stuff. Uh, and he keeps that he keeps one. That's that. in his profile. Yeah, it's yeah. the other the one. The living, living lore, each time right. a friendly Moria dwarf slays an enemy hero or monster yeah. model, he recovers a point of will. So he loses that one. Right. So, the and the, the other thing that you lose for this as a yellow alliance is the um the Casa Doom army bonus, which is actually really good. Um, so that stinks, but um, but you do get the you know fight five elves with the glaives behind your you know defense seven dwarfs. So you've got a pretty solid battle line with a lot of shooting. Um, yeah, I mean it's definitely a different list than I would have thought of, and that's kind of cool, right? Yeah, I learned I like something that. about Flowey today. So, yep, I like the two ballistas too because that gives forty-eight inch range to the whole thing. And then, like on today's episode of Fun with Flowey, like they have right. the Shadow Lord, and you just like snap your fingers and you're like, no. So I like so, it a lot. I think it mm -hmm. does well with Legless, also because that makes Legless's special role even more powerful with all that he has 
Um, he can shoot three instead of just one to auto hit now. If you have something like Blinding Light, yeah, I, I like it a lot. And then yeah. he maxed out a lot of the dwarfs with shields. I like that he didn't bring any two handers. The dwarfs with shields at D7 are going to make your battle line pretty sturdy. Yeah, no, I, I, I also, I also like the list. I mean, I, so I, I was, I was trying to think of some way. There are two ways I think this list could. Uh, be ramped up a bit, but I have to say I couldn't figure out a way I wanted to do either of them. One would be to get a King's Champion into this list somehow. That's exactly what I was thinking, exactly. And, uh, unfortunately, the King's Champion is is Fortitude, so you can't replace... You need the King to allow the Alliance. You have to get rid of mm -hmm. Floyd or the Ballistas. Yeah, and you don't want to get rid of Floyd, mm -hmm. Floyd, and I don't think you want to get rid of both Ballistas. You could probably stand to get rid of one Ballista and do something else with it, but I'm not... I'm not sure what else you do except, you know, plump out Legolas's warband with a few more elves, and I'm not certain that's worth it. Um, there is a glaring problem, though. I mean, he is very weak to enemy heroes running rampant. Like, I mean, assuming he can shoot him down in range, but I mean, like, Contest of Champions or anything Yeah, like that's that. true. So, that's true. one question is, if you're just trying to bring mostly in Legolas, why don't you just drop Legolas's warband entirely and add a King's Champion and more dwarves? Well, like, because your numbers shoot down to what? Uh, thirty something. Well, he'd he'd lose he'd lose uh, thirteen models, which would bring him down to thirty four. That's pretty harsh, considering yeah. that. Remember, six of his models are dwarf crew. It's artificial inflation. Mm -hmm. but, That's true. That's yeah, true. So it, now he's down to well, 34, 28 combat troops. No, twenty seven because Floyd. Mm -hmm. That it's, I getting rid of the L's. The L's are the only thing that saves it. Yeah. Well, let's. <laughs> Yeah, I try. I tried to like try to see how to change it when he made the comment, and I just, I don't know. This is just like a good way to structure it, I guess, because you have so much defense bodies that it's kind of making that shooting that more important. And then the whole enemy heroes running rampant, like the D seven, will help against good heroes who are only strength four. So I don't know how I would change would, it. Would you drop maybe three models for an extra banner? Because I know that they have the Merkwood Elf with Banner, but then you get a second Banner, so then you get that King's Champion effect, and then you cover. Yeah, that that's not the. So the what, King's what, Champion is he he can kill stuff. Well, I get like that. that. I get that he can kill stuff, but it's, I mean, you clearly yeah, can't strike. that into this. So I'm just wondering if that's like the the, the Banner range then helps this. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I was also trying to figure out a way to get. I mean, because another. Mm -hmm. uh, Another way to do it would be to put, um, you know, a wizard in. I mean, if you could get Gandalf in here, you, you could have him have the ability to regenerate Flowey's will if he had any extra time, and you'd have like a transfix. But I, I mean, I don't see any way to to do that either. I mean, that was the thing I couldn't figure out. I couldn't figure out any way to kind of do any of the additional fun stuff we would mm -hmm. want to do with this list. So. I mean, I, I, I get that it's – so I get that this list is – has trouble with power heroes. Um, Flowey can, to a certain extent, counteract some of them. Legolas, to a certain extent, can counteract some of them. Um, and maybe you just have to hope between that and the ballistas it's enough. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So, you know, we, we, we talked about how and, – and, and I apologize, Kalthas, if, if your intention was to have them, obviously – but we always talk about how it, when you leave a list, you know, leave the general idea of what you wanted to do. And he said he wanted to run a ranged heavy dwarf list, but he didn't mention that the ballistas were key to it. So are you mm -hmm. guys thinking maybe get rid of the ballistas and add some more stuff to there or I, maybe, maybe get rid of one? I, I keep both. I think like because it's 50 points, you can't really add much besides a couple elves or restructure mm -hmm. the list itself, and then it'd be just a pure dwarf list. Uh, I 60, keep both. 60 points. It's 120. So for it's 120. Yeah. Both. Beca because like you how have... Much is, so how much is the 40, King's Champion? 48. 140. 140. So you could, drop, you could drop like two elves in both ballistas and take and basically mm -hmm. throw the King's Champion into the list somewhere. So you would lose... But you're giving them banner bonuses considering... Well then, do you do actually? You that's true. You could drop. You could drop banner. the elf. You could yeah. drop the elf banner. The Merkwood elf with banner, and maybe yeah. you know just make him a regular shield and glaive guy. Mm -hmm. 
So you would go down to 40, uh, was it 44 models, I believe, at that point? Because you have yeah, 16. Yeah, the King's Champion bump them back up. Yeah, so I think, you'd, I think you'd go down to 44 models with the King's Champion in there at that yeah. point. But I, you obviously... I mean, at that point, you're winning all those banner scenarios because killing the two Heralds is... It's tough. Oh, yeah. It's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so are you guys thinking maybe drop the Ballistas? I would I would keep it because I mean mm -hmm. this the whole ranged battle you have forty eight inches and fl flowy they're gonna close on you fast but that even makes the dwarf bows that much more dangerous because they they shoot at a short range and you're gonna have like a long killing zone to bring them to you and then once they come in close a really really good killing zone and I think the forty seven models with a lot of D seven is enough to mitigate heavy hitting heroes. It's not, oh, I, I wouldn't add someone to kill the heavy hitting heroes. I think the list as is could mitigate them, if that makes sense. I, mean, I think there's a definitely good argument to keep them. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a little yeah. tough. I mean, I, I just feel like he will, like, it, if he wasn't Dwarves, if he wasn't a majority Dwarves, I would say absolutely put them in King's Champion. But the fact that he's a huge defense seven army with a fight five backup, it's possible that you know, bigger heroes would have a little bit of trouble with this. It's just at 800 points, you are fighting any of the big heroes that, you know, they want to throw at this. Mm -hmm. All right. So hang, hang on a second. I want to see if I can make this math work a different way. Because he's got... Uh, where where are the dwarves? There are the dwarves. Um, all right. So the dwarf ballista is 60 points. And he's got an additional crew. So that's 68 points. Mm -hmm. So he drops the dwarf ballista. One, say he drops one dwarf ballista with the extra crew. That's 68 points. Say he drops the banner from the Merkwood elf. That's 73, 93 points. And then we need to somehow find 47 additional points points here um that would be probably five elves or maybe a combination of elf and dwarf about five models yeah um and you know maybe i mean maybe he could drop like a, a few so the the Merkwood elves with glaive and bow come in at what well, With Glaive and Bow, I think they're 12, aren't they? Yeah, I think they're 12. So he could drop those four guys. I mean, right? if you drop the archers, then yeah. But he said he wanted to run a ranged heavy dwarf. Yeah, well, he's still got a Ballista, 10 Dwarf Bows, and Legolas. So that's still guess, a yeah. ranged heavy yeah. army, right? Um, you could also get some he, points by dropping the shields on the Glaive Elves, right? Since they're behind D7 anyway. Oh yeah, that's true. That's like eight points there, I think. Yeah, that's well. If you got, if you specifically points. got rid of the four elves, that's forty-eight points, which is fits Matt's forty-seven. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you drop the four elves plus one uh, dwarf ballista in the banner, that would get you the king's champion. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm also not convinced that the shield and glaive mm -hmm. is necessary, um, especially if they're standing behind. Dwarves, so that's a source of points. Anyway, mm -hmm. I think there, I think there is a way. If you drop the the Elven banner, one of the dwarf ballistas, and then kind of trim some stuff off of the elves, or maybe you know, tr you know, a combination of trimming elves and trimming, you know, some dwarves to get a king's champion into this list. You will lose a lot of ranged firepower, which brings in it. Like it may be possible that even without the shout at the pull of darkness or the blinding light that they still outshoot him. Mm -hmm. Well, he has doors, but they'll fire it as a back line of now. We yeah, but, it, but he's still, he's still got a ballista, right? And that, that ballista with flowy turning off blinding light is going to tend to between the ballista and Legolas, regardless of whether he's kind of winning the shooting duel over time is going to pull people toward him mm -hmm. just because Legolas is going to be killing off heroes and the ballista is going to be, you know, punching holes through him, you know, especially since, I mean, he can kind of stand off outside of 24 inches with that ballista and, and start checking rocks into stuff. Mm -hmm. I, sus I, I suspect it's going to be a rare army that is not going to charge 
toward him even with that trimming. But in any case, I mean, mm -hmm. it, I, I mean, I, this version I think works if you want to kind of go heavily into the shoot at range basket. I think there is a way to get a king's champion in here um, with a dwarf, getting rid of one dwarf ballista and a banner and some other mm -hmm. stuff, and that you know, in a situation, because, I mean, there are going to be a bunch of scenarios where you're going to start close in. So, um, and, and those two dwarf ballistas are, are going to, you know, not kind of be of, of maximum use. So, um, you I know, think it, one it other, might be better to have the King's Champion in, in certain circumstances. One other scenario we didn't, I don't believe we mentioned, was Maelstrom missions, where the dwarf ballistas are putting a they have to kind of go in the same spot. So everyone else is going to be feeling very, very pressured to deploy around them. And you have Floyd with what? One point of mine, you have a Dwarf King with two. And mm -hmm. so you can be burning through a lot of your available might points in those type of missions. Um, Cause it's, it's a little deceptive. Yeah. You say eight might, but you know, two of them are attached to the ballistas. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, ha having actually, they actually played a Maelstrom scenario against somebody who had a pair of ballistas. There's an argument to be made for not putting them in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, there's an argument to be made for keeping them separate so that yeah. the other guy either has to split his army up to cover both of them, or at most you'll lose one. And I don't one, think that's smart. And then, one, and then one, once one goes down, the other one just shoots into whatever killed it. Yeah. Um, I actually happened to play against a pair of dwarf ballistas that started next to each other with a Mumak. And because the Mumak can step over things that are more than, that are less than two inches tall, the Mumak just walked over both ballistas on turn one and killed the entire cruise and um, just kept on walking. And then that was back before they made the, uh, the rules change to prevent, you know, you from occupying somebody else's siege weapons. So I had my, Haradrim kind of running up in the back behind the Mumak and remanning the ballistas <laughs> <laughs> that had been decrewed. But uh, yeah, I think there is, I, I think with dwarf ballistas, I think there's a reason to keep them separate in Maelstrom. Are we, are we more of a fan of, you know, if we're going to have ballistas, you might as well have two, or are we thinking, you know, you can get away with one and then kind of have the sacrifices to add the King's champion. What, what's everyone's thoughts on after hearing both kind of options? I'm like 50 50 to be honest. Like, I like the idea, especially going back to our episode where we talked about bringing like a lot of listas. I just like that idea coupled with Flowey, coupled with mm -hmm. Legolas, coupled with those strength three dwarf bows. I like that, but also that you don't really have to sacrifice much to get the King's Champion, and the King's Champion balances the list. So I'm about 50 50. So I, I tend to think that one dwarf ballista and Legolas is enough. Um, and you're right. Having the second ballista would be better in those scenario situations where it's going to be a long range, you know, kind of exchange of bombardment type scenarios, but not all scenarios are like that. And this, this, so this particular list would be at a significant disadvantage in contest of champions. Um, and, and, would and it a couple of like that. I Legolas is the leader. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure about. That. I mean, I'm not. Well, no, the problem with contest of champions is you 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 start in the other guy's face, and mm -hmm. the ballistas are essentially irrelevant in that scenario because they still have to stay at the back, and they can't shoot through stuff. Yeah, I know, but the whole point of that scenario, right, is to get the most kills, right? With with, with the no, leader. With the and leader, but you have a fight. You, yeah, but you have a fight six guy who has heroic strike i mean I'm yeah, not that, that, that's right but you've still wasted 136 points on ballistas that aren't going mm -hmm. to do anything now i i like the idea of two ballistas in maelstorm though because you can first deploy them in random corners or not corners because you can't corners but six inches away from the corner just there and if your opponent goes and attacks both of them well that's good whatever he just wasted a whole war ban on a ballista for a turn and stuff, and you can deploy wherever you want. So I actually even like the two ballistas in Maelstorm yeah, no, because it gives you that flexibility. That, that's fine. I, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the problem scenario. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the, contest. It's the problem. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's contest of champions, and then um, also the scenarios where you, you basically, the other side can start up to halfway in the board edge, and there's, mm -hmm. there's kind of a bunch of those. Um, mm -hmm. another, another problem scenario would be 
I can't remember the name of it, but that objective scenario where you have like the four uh, objectives that are aligned like in a diamond pattern within oh, yes. 12 inches yes. from the center <laughs> of the board. That's another one that kind of forces you to kind of condense toward the center. You can't just, you can't hope to win that. Well, you often can't hope to win that scenario by like standing back in the back six inches of the board and trying to shoot your opponent. Mm. He'll run up, he'll grab all the objectives and then he'll die and he'll win. Yeah, I, I really like that dwarf ballistas are pretty cheap for what they do, but in so many scenarios, being a good more, war machine that direct fires becomes such a liability because you become dead um, the minute the battle lines clash. So I'm I'm probably about fifty fifty, like Rainier said on this. Like I could see it both ways. Yeah, my vote's probably going to go toward the king's champion list only because well, you know I I love the idea of having two ballistas, but I just feel like your only heroic striker, the only one, I mean. King possibly, but the only heroic striker, as soon as he loses that heroic strike duel off, he's pretty easily gets his butt kicked. I mean, like, yeah, three fate, I believe two wounds, and then like defense five, no six. He has armor, right? Does he? Uh, the King's the champion. one. No, nah, the legless. legless oh yeah, armor, the legless right? one has armor. Okay, so heroes can still beat him up pretty easily. So that that would be my only fear on that. Yeah, he's not a he's not a combat hero, even though he yeah. can fight. Yeah, he's kind of like a backup combat hero. He's like throw him in after Thranduil is <laughs> like already you know the spats. But um, you know, I tried to think of some other L's to replace him because I'm like you know the rest of the warband doesn't care if they're Merkwood, Rivendell, or Galadrim. They just want L's. Yeah, well, no, but, you you want Legolas here. I mean, the the whole there, there's a lot of things that can happen mm -hmm. with Legolas and Flowey that it, it's not uh, yeah, just that you true. want. It's not just that you want like fight five to back up your fight four. That's yeah. that's not a big deal. It's the fact that you have um, Legolas uh, in here to to screw around with blinding light, or I'm yeah. sorry, mm -hmm. Floyd to screw around with blinding light and Legolas to um, kill ring wraiths and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't find another elf to replace that Legolas anyway. He's just too cheap. So. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Okay, um, I think my vote would probably, after listening to Matt talk, I'd probably go with the dropping for the King's Champion. I yeah. think it, Matt has that effect on men. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I figured what he was going to say is, after listening to Matt talk, I, I'm just going to, I, whatever, he, whatever he doesn't recommend is the way to go. <laughs> I find him annoying. <laughs> um, thank you for your list, Calfest. Let us know if you take any of our, con our, our uh, thoughts into consideration or if you run the list as is and, and let us know how you do with it. Uh, as a reminder, everyone else, please share your list so that we can have a, a bunch of lists to go over and consider. Uh, we're going to go into the main topic, which is fiefdoms list that we have all written. Um, I know that um, we have some 700 point lists, some 800 point lists, and we even have a thousand point list in case anybody really likes their fiefdoms. Um, so we'll start off with the 700 point lists. And I know Rob, you have a bunch of them. So if you want to go over those. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when it comes to the fiefdoms, if I'm being honest, I'm almost always going to want to play them as a pure army, just because I just think that all of their bonuses for being a pure army and that the way that they have synergy is really good. So if I am going to ally into fiefdoms, um, it's really for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons would be to have a better replacement frontline troop for your Knight of Dolamroth on foot because they're just, I think, a little bit overcosted for what they bring to the table um, and they have allies that can cover that gap. Or it's because you very specifically want uh, one of the various Gondor heroes that you know, keys off of the Gondor keyword so that they can affect Fiefdom's troops. And from in that perspective, I think you're really looking at um, Hurin, or Boromir specifically with the banner. Um, so with that in mind, I kind of wrote a couple of lists that take advantage of any one of those various things. And I am happy to share them. Uh, in most of the lists, the fiefdoms portion doesn't change much. It's really mostly the Gondor ally that I bring in that is going to slightly change the list. Um, so which one do you guys want to hear first? I've got one for Denethor, I've got one for Hurin, I've got one for Boromir. Start at the beginning. It's generally a very good place to start. And all these yeah. options are, they're, they're really way out on me. Let's go daddy first, and then baby after that, and then cousin after that. Perfect. That I love it. So um, 
uh, one of the reasons, like I said, to bring in Gondor allies for me is to get a better frontline troop. Uh, you can kind of go two directions with this. One is just warriors of Minas Tirith because they can get the D7 and the shield wall. And the other is essentially a straight swap between a Knight of Dol Amroth for a Guard of the Fountain Court because they're the same exact points, but the Guard of the Fountain Court is going to bring so many benefits that the Knight of Dol Amroth does not. Um, so the first list, uh, this is the Denethor ally since we're going daddy first, right? Um, like I said, the fiefdoms portion doesn't tend to change much. I have uh, Imrahil with a horse and a lance, because you're always going to take him with a horse and a lance. He's leading three knights of Dol Amroth with uh, horses and lances, four men at arms of Dol Amroth, two axemen, and four blackroot archers with spears. Then for the second warband, I have four long on a horse, and he's leading four men at arms, two axemen. Uh, and four Blackroot Archers, two of them have spears. And then you've got Denethor, who automatically becomes your leader, which is double-edged sword. On the one hand, um, it means Imrahil is a little bit more free to die because he doesn't give up leader points. Um, but on the other hand, it means that scenarios like Contest of Champions are going to really suck because Denethor isn't great. But he is leading uh, 13 Fountain Court with shields and two Citadel Guard with uh, horses and bows. And that gets you up to 41 models um, and 10 bows. And uh, you've got essentially a bodyguarded front line with D7 and then all of the various fiefdom troops behind them to bring in the supports and be bannered by Imrahil. Um, and two heroes that kind of ride around killing stuff. Now, I think of the list, this one has the most weaknesses because it has no march, it doesn't have a lot of strikers, and it really is going to rely more on the troops to do the work and grind it out. But, um, but that is one way to kind of up your model count if you're going to bring in any allies at all. So, I mean, how, how many models total? 41. 41. Yeah. 41, 10 bows, what, three, six points of might? Uh, six points of might, yeah. And the 12 inch banner effect is pretty good. And so, how many so yeah. points was this? Uh, 700 points. 700 points. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, I really like the idea in Contest of Champions. Of, like, then you just take Imrahil and you just have him charge the enemy's uh, uh, champion and, you know, take yeah. him out and give him a run for his money. While Denethor walks around with his, like, two guards of the Fountain Court buddies and like hold that guy down yeah. <laughs> all right hold that guy down <laughs> yeah. I, I know he has a, the fight five like yeah <laughs> I, know, I know he has a sword but i just i would love dennis i just imagine him like slapping him about like you go you go you go <laughs> i just, just imagine him lighting him on fire right? yeah that's right yeah. Taking that torch <laughs> and just sticking it in their face yeah. the, the only character to have a flamethrower kind of concept <laughs> no I'm, I'm picturing sauron from the books when he lifted gilglad and he just burst into flames yeah. like i want I want to see Denthor do that. Or like at the he has his two guys hold him up like fire, this, right? and then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah. So that um, that list has some weaknesses, but it uh, it brings in a good amount of numbers. And you know, one of the obvious questions would be uh, if you were to drop the Fountain Court and bring them down to Warriors, if that wouldn't be better. But ultimately, when you do the math, that gets you like three extra models. And I don't think that's worth losing all of the various bonuses that the Fountain Court are going to bring on the front, uh, front line. That's not to say I wouldn't always do it. I just think in this list, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and so uh, essentially, the, the second list you said was, was the Boromir one was Sun, right? Mm -hmm. So this one uh, has a pretty low model count because when you're bringing in Boromir with the banner into a list that already has Imrahil in it, you're going to have two mega heroes and not a lot of numbers. But the way that I kind of, you know, get around that is to just make sure that everything you have in the list is rock hard, right? Um, this is a list that I'm not sure isn't better just running as pure Gondor, but essentially you've got Imrahil on a, with, on a horse with a lance, three Knights of Dol Amroth with horses and a lance, and 11 men-at-arms. And then Boromir with horse shield in the banner of Minas Tirith, 12 fountain court with shields, two citadel guard with bows on horses. And the whole point of that is that you have a brick of, you know, usually fight six, D7, that is just going to hold the line while your heroes kind of do the work. Um, it has pretty low numbers. It's only got 30 models in it, which is, you know, you have to only kill 16 to break it. It's not easy to do with defense seven, and it doesn't have a lot of bows. So you're definitely having to go to your opponent if they have shooting. But truth be told, as much as I love them, getting Boromir uh, into a 700 point list as an ally uh, gets pretty tough. So 
But if you really want to play around with fight, set, uh, fight six troops, this is the way to do it. Fight six knights on armored horses with lance. Yeah. It's pretty good. And then, um, and then the last two, I actually, it turns out I have one for Hurin and one for Eroles. Um, but I'll do the Hurin one because Eroles is essentially a version of the Denethor one that just brings in more troops, more or less. Um, and the Hurin one you would bring in because it, uh, Imrahil having the Gondor keyword means that if you do lose Imrahil, you don't actually give up the leader points so long as Hurin is in the list. This one also gets you a decent amount of numbers, um, uh, two strikers and three heroes that have bonuses to charge so they can do a little bullying. Uh, the, the top portion for the fiefdoms is the same as the previous lists with Imrahil with three knights, four men at arms, two clansmen and four archers, four long on a horse with four men at arms, two clansmen and four archers. Uh, and then Hurin on a horse with 10 warriors of Minas Tirith with shield and five rangers with spears. And that gets you 41 models, 13 bows, and a little bit more versatility. It still doesn't have march. For that, you bring in Irolas or Medrail, which are both excellent choices. Um, but it's got a little bit more teeth. It still has numbers. Uh, it still can have a defense seven front line. So, and, so that's how I would bring in um, Hurin. So... Just so I understand, that Hurin's ability still triggers with Imrahil because he's a god yes, hero. Right? Yes, it does. Yes. Obviously, Imrahil would be the leader here because he's legend. So. Yeah. I was just making sure that his ability still works. Which, which ability? His ability so to take over. So oh. he doesn't take over, but he denies your opponent points for killing the leader unless points, you kill yeah. both of them. Well, I think the lore thematic thing they were trying to show was that he's taking over command of the army, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, does when the steward right. is not available. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I, th I thought you were talking about the the extra <laughs> die, but right. Oh, I don't. I don't. I mean, that's a gimmick that he has. Yeah. So I forget about. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever gotten that to go off more or yeah. less. But yeah. oh, I, I, oh that, I mean, that's that's. I, I mean, that's why remember. you. Well, that's why you throw him in with. Um, that's why you throw him in with Aragorn or Denethor, and he just fights near them. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, he ends up becoming a real bodyguard for Denethor at that point, to your point yeah. about like contests. He just walks around with him and beats stuff up. So, yeah. Well, he's, he's also a nice tag team with Aragorn. Mm -hmm. because, um, um, in this list, since you don't have the bodyguard, you, uh, there's an argument to be made to change out all the axemen for clansmen um, because they do bring some of that courage. But the premise is essentially the same. You're bringing in Gondor to either get a good hero or better frontline troops or both. So, And this, this one has nine might, which is a little more teethy. It still has 41 models, um, and it's got the 13 bows. So even though the Black Roots aren't usually going to be getting all their bonuses, you're still getting shots downrange. So the... What's the what's the frontline troop in this? Is it? I, it's warriors of Minas Tirith. The warriors of Minas Tirith, who are courage four anyway. So yeah, well, they're um, gonna be courage five with um with the four longhorn. Right yeah. with the four longhorn. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you really don't need the um yeah the clansmen. I know mm -hmm. that we talked about this last week, obviously, but you know after th after um you know looking at four long's profile, I just like I know that the army bonus of Minas Tirith is very good. I just think about like adding him to most, you know, Minas Tirith lists now, just because with that Warhorn, <laughs> you have courage five troops mm -hmm. up front and like the ability to have that in a list. I just think, and then you have D seven as well. I mean, it's, I just love four long in most lists now. Yeah, and fight, buy some, buy some heads. clansmen yeah. and you can have some fight, some courage six guys up front. Yeah. <laughs> you just super courageous. I just, yeah. I just love the idea of adding four long into Minas Tirith list now. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. I was trying to go for the, um, this is still a fiefdoms list with an ally as opposed to the opposite, right? In my, personal gaming i'm probably usually going gondor first and then doing something like adding yeah. in a four long right i agree with you completely but the challenge for me was not to give into that temptation and not to just put 800 fountain court with boromir so well i mean I just, I just <laughs> and one, one five times guy <laughs> i just imagine taking like like uh Huron, boromir and four long and you just have like three really decent hitters. Totally. With, well, a ton of troops. And you just go, wow, you know, this is actually genuinely difficult to yeah. kind of fight through. Yep. I mean, having that defense seven bodyguarded with a spear front line um, really makes a huge difference. And then getting two pikes behind it if they're fight six is a lot of fun. So. Okay. Um, so that's our 700 point list. We'll move on to some of the 800 point list. Um, 
Rainier, I know you had an 800 point allied list if you want to go over that. Okay, yes. Yeah. So I don't know if it's competitive, but I know it'd be fun to play. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did play Fiefdens once at Articon in doubles, and I just had a blast with I, I brought a pure theme list with some Highlanders and Bonnie Prince Charlie. I mean, <laughs> Prince Imrahil, and I was just ready to go. Um, so I wanted to include some clansmen into my list, and I wanted to like spam as many models as as I could. So my it is a Minister Earth Fiefton, uh eight hundred point allied list. So um, Green Alliance right there. My first warband is doing here. He has eight nine Black Root Veil archers with nothing, just the bow. Three clansmen. Second warband is four long on horse. So the guy we we're just talking about with all his perks, um, he's he has ten pike, um, so ten men at arms and five clansmen. And then here comes into the ministereth. Um, I've got Denethor. Um, he's automatically my my leader. He's leading seven fountain court guard with shield, and seven ministereth warriors with shield. One of and then I'll throw in a banner and on one of those warriors. So the banner is included in that. And uh, my next warband is Huron, mounted with two knights of Minas Tirith, six warriors of Minas Tirith with shield, and three rangers with bow and spear. And my last warband is the Avenger Bolt. So it is uh, 800 points and 59 models. So I'm almost, I want to drop something to make it 60. So the, just your to heroes were, <laughs> say all your heroes again? Heroes are Forlong, Doing Here, Denethor, Huron. So I have three fight five heroes. Um, um, of course, Denethor is one of them, so he doesn't count. But um, Denethor, besides, let's not say we're playing uh, Contest of Champions, but in any of the lists, I could even fight with Denethor, and if I keep Huron alive, it doesn't matter. How many um, bows do you have? I have one, two, three, four, ten, thirteen bows and the Avenger Bolt. Now just, this is where the list comes in. It's not. What was you gonna say? Oh, I'm just curious. If Huron takes command of the army does he become the leader for the points of killing in contest of champions he does not no no he does not oh okay because i was about to be like dude put hit put denethor right in front of the bolt thrower <laughs> <laughs> no, I, otherwise I, I, i'd throw him on the pyre myself every <laughs> game right yeah exactly <laughs> no so the basic of it is i do have 59 models um fight four within the list i have uh defense seven with the uh, with the shield wall basically throughout the whole army so i've got my defense in there now i'm not going to just massively annihilate people in shooting um that's not my plan doing here is specialized his war band with archers can take out whatever i want it to take out so if there's a mega hero or a monster i want him to take that out not just that but the avenger bullet also kind of plays that other role it's not going to mow down troops or take out anything but a powerful punch like what we talked about and what we would change in the game what a crossbow should be is the avenger bolt it doesn't fire often but when it works it kills whatever it hits so those are two scary things i also have three random rangers thrown in with hearns warband because why not they can just pick off some other stuff maybe dehorse someone here or there but yeah i like the list it has basically a lot of what i want to take the clansmen aren't going to be my front line. They can always be flankers or just be objective grabbers. I brought them for theme, but also having played them at Articon, they do actually sometimes work, <laughs> especially with a banner effect. You will roll sixes. Their courage is amazing, especially with the warhorn and the bonus. Um, so going up against spirits or something like that, they do kill stuff pretty well. Yeah, so that that's what it is. It's a horde. Um, Forlong can actually kill a lot of stuff. He can also tie down things. Huron, we all know about what Huron can do. He's not a grenade, but he can still work as a semi-grenade. And a defense seven battle line to stop from dying. I just think the objective game, I could play pretty well, especially with those two shooting war bands being the Avenger Bolt and doing here, just selective shooting is what I call it. Like it's They're not going to take out war bands here and there, but selective shooting. If the enemy has heavy shooting, they have to worry about my shooting while my army advances. So they're not going to take out as much. If they have a hero, I can take them out. Or if they have just, let's say a 40, 40, 40 model army, I could still take out maybe like six or five before combat hits. And then I almost outnumber them by, by, by two. So that's what I like about the list. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about was dropping Huron for the likes of Madril. And that'll work better with the 
Heroic March and the Maelstorm games to where I could basically just put my horde wherever it wants. Madrigal so, works on me as Tirith, though, right? Yeah, he does. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but, still affecting, but you just go with him okay. first, right? Yeah, yeah go, go with him first. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So like that's that's that Madril maybe for the march or 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 the millstorm. But I also like the idea that like okay, I'm not going to march straight up into my opponent's face. The idea of the army is just bring the horde, have the defensive sevens where you don't die so fast, and have that selective shooting while also having two good heroes on horses at five five. Huron has has Burley. What's his face? Forlong has Lance. Like that'll kill stuff. And of course, you have Denethor going crazy, slaughtering his own people. But that's <laughs> yeah. so yeah, that, that's what it is. Yeah, fifty nine sure. points, eight hundred or fifty nine models, eight hundred points. So you don't have Amber Hill on the list? Just I do not. I, I, okay. I wanted to bring. I, that I was first, listening I through the whole thing, and I was like, waiting for Amber Hill, waiting for Amber yeah. Hill. Yeah. I figured everyone <laughs> yeah. would bring Amber here, and I was like, ah, uh, maybe I won't. Like just just for flair, and then also, I just want to bring the horde. <laughs> What, but that, but, I, the, but uh, that twelve inch banner would work really well in this. But then I was realizing that the list could go like more towards fifty, and I want it to go more towards sixty, just because I'm a psycho. What I, what I really love um, in your little psycho list is the interplay between her and Denethor and Forlong, right? Because uh, because of the Minister bonus and forlong you've got a courage seven denethor so he's like never failing that courage test yeah. right <laughs> well, and even if he dies you don't care because you have her in right so like you said you can <laughs> throw him in and for 35 points he's got a monster profile right so like no yeah. might sucks but fight five two attacks for 35 points is pretty good so i mean he's brings, never you know, he's never failed his courage test anyway right Never, never, especially when you customize paint him, which I'm going to do and make him look like <laughs> Guy Ferrarni, that, that cook guy with the beard <laughs> and the God hair Fieri. spiked up. I'm Guy Fieri, and he's just going to be like that with like a fire face, like, come on at me, let's go. God. Can you have him like holding like a pizza in one hand and like... I'm going to have him, well, because I'm from the Philly group, he's going to have a Philly cheesesteak. Oh can my you, uh, God. <laughs> can you please have, have, have him on a base with Barleyman, like he's buying food from him? Yes. Diners drive in yes. lifestyle. Well, I'm going to use Barlamin and make him look like Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. So that's what my theme is going to be. You know what you should do? You should have like one of those, like, uh, you know, like the lemonade sign things where it's like above it and it'll say diners, drive-ins, and dives. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this, is, I, I think greatest, this is going to be the greatest model ever. Assembled. I think you should just have Barlamin with his plate there, like handing it to Denethor and Denethor going, there are no cherry tomatoes. I specifically ordered cherry tomatoes. Where are the yes. cherry tomatoes? <laughs> and then Denethor kills him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, at this point, you got to go all out and make the uh, make the Avenger bolt thrower on top of like a food truck or something. So, <laughs> like, yeah, and then Huron's going to ride a hot dog, basically just a giant. Hot dog. We're taking this way too far, guys. Does he People not like, already? Is this a podcast about we, the game? We, we we took this way too far about a minute and thirty seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, this, really, this joke really. Uh, shocks <laughs> that's out. right. I just Devin's I would love to see a guy like, Fury Devin. I just yeah, that would right. just that would make my tournament. This was. This was the Saturday Night Live sketch that wouldn't die. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This is, this is the one where like all the writers get together and they go, you know what, this is really great. And then it gets on the stage and everybody's like, why did they do this? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, so, not um, being, it's not being funny three minutes ago. So I guess, uh, I mean, in regard to the whole list, I mean, I, you know, I love a horde Gondor. And so, I mean, 60 models at, what, you said 700 points? 800. 800. 800. I suppose a lot of people are going to be able to take it on it. You know, the majority troop type you have is like all defense five and less, and then you have defense no, six. But like, more, more than half of it is defense seven with shield wall. With so I have seven, seven fountain court guard, and let me see, 13 shielded Mr. Earth warriors, and then, of course, two knights. So they got their, their stuff, and then I've got 10 pike, and outside of that, then, then, then where you get to the lower. So I'd say the majority, not the majority, but... At least more than half is defense yeah. seven. About half is defense oh, seven. So don't you don't you dare poke no holes, Dev. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just figured he'd pick on someone because we just let Rob read his list, and we're like, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, yeah. <laughs> Rob can do no wrong. It's, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, part of it was oh, Rob I don't know about that. Through, <laughs> Rob read through three lists so fast. We were all like, 
I can't remember what's in these lists. So yeah, process. The list. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yep, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> list. <laughs> That just no, but like, it, it, it has glaring like weaknesses of course like it's not like a combat heavy army but like my hope was just like back to the to the list we reviewed like enough d7 to kind of like stop from dying so fast plus the idea that like fight four is within the whole list and then the the kill squad of doing here he's like the i'm gonna make him the american sniper actually so he's gonna be there and he can like take out anything um yeah, with the Avenger Bolt, just because, like, I want that food truck. Yeah. Well, I mean, so there's like, something to be said for having a list that, you know, the, the way it deals with big, scary heroes is it just, you know, th- there's always more guys, right? Um, and, you know, you throw the big, scary hero in, you know, against a couple guys. And, I mean, it, the, now I can't remember. D, d, you had Pikeman in there, right? Yeah, ten pikemen. Ten pikemen. Yeah. So you, so like you know, big scary hero charges like two of your guys, and then four pikemen walk up behind them. So all of a sudden yeah. he's fighting, you know, six dice, and you know if he doesn't roll that six, he's got to spend all his might mm-hmm. to make sure he wins, because mm-hmm. otherwise he's he's off his horse. And that's and and I, and I learned this playing like uh, corsair spams and stuff too. Sometimes you don't have to bring a big fist to take out the mega hero. Sometimes you just gotta make that mega hero, like let's say he's 250 points or Boromir, for example, sometimes you just got to make him only kill 50 or 60 points worth the whole game or even 70 points worth the whole game. Sacrifice a hero, time up the game, there's 50 points, but then you kind of waste, your opponent wasted around 190 points the whole game. So that's what I, what I take it, like why the bodies are there because you can throw one or two, three, four, like you could, sacrifice a few and not risk me broken and even if you are broken like you're like courage six like clansmen <laughs> like, like, yeah so and body your bodyguard too. yeah the only downside is you gotta like find a horse that's big enough for uh for um uh for long mm-hmm. that's true it's a problem fiefdoms have in general so yeah finding big enough horses Mm-hmm. And it's 2021, so we're not all about animal cruelty. So, like, we know it's cruel to like. And also, Matt, we don't fat shame. I don't know where you're going with this. But, you know, <laughs> and we're not fat shaming. We're just this is merely a comment on the um, uh, on the relative inavailability of XXL horses. <laughs> what, what do you know? Who does fat shame and German shame is unreleased miniatures calling him Fat Bismarck on horse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> that's fat German shaming right there. That's not cool. That's not cool. That's we in all fact know. a targeted attack at an individual. It's true. So I'm like I'm unacceptable. Like point, I'm point five percent German probably, mm-hmm. and like I'm offended. By that. We all know that fat Germans are jolly. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Let's stop this before it gets too far. Guys. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let's go uh, back to her and writing a hot dog before yeah. you know, this goes off the rails. <laughs> that was, that was, <laughs> I think, uh, oh, okay. uh, I was just going to go over, uh, unless, does anyone have any other comments on Rainier's list? So you guys agree that mine is like tailored to win every single tournament and it's perfect. Thank I've you. already Continue. given up. So you, your game is yours. I mean, I, I do have to oh, say good, that the money the, went through. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I do have to say that the like the hundred point Goblin Town when it shows up and sees that it's fighting fifty nine points of <laughs> of you know fight four dudes is going to be like, uh. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yep. At eight hundred points, it's eight hundred, right? You said mm-hmm. at that point level, though, Goblin Town can get like, I think they get to like hundred twenty. Yeah, I think they get a little ridiculous. That's true. Well, I, mean, I, su- I suppose uh, it would be all over. In a zero, the game. It would be over <laughs> in a zero-zero draw on turn two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think it would be interesting because Rainier, how many bows did you say you had? Thirteen. So I have thirteen. It's not like overpowered, but it's like enough. I mean, if you took out, let's say, like four goblins a turn, and you did that for four turns, and you, there's sixteen right there, that brings you down to 104. I mean, basically 100 versus. You know, and then you're getting into combat, and at that point, obviously, you have to deal with like the Goblin King, and but 
at that point, Goblin Town will have so much might they'll blow all of it to you Hurric marches at every single turn. And, yeah, that's true. Well, I, I mean, you did say that this was not necessarily the most competitive list, and if it loses to uh, Goblin Town, it loses to Goblin well, Town. I, I think it'll I do well, it right? Goblin Goblin Town, Town, I'm not sure it does, honestly. I, I mean, we're not sure it does, but even the comparison even to Goblin Town is almost nonsensical because Goblin Town's such an outlier list. Like, it's one of those lists you never prepare for because if you come up against it, it's sort of like. All right. Like, yeah. 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 It'll probably more well, come against like an, a list that's like around forty-five models with like one or two mega heroes and other like shenanigans with it. You're playing so like that, that scenario. There, there are a bunch yeah. of horde lists that will show up with like you know at eight hundred points with like 80, 80, 90 models, something like that. And yeah, but they're not the average. I think most hordes are so. Yeah. But even even that, yeah. like, I'm not too right. scared of it. Like, I played. No, I, I you you shouldn't be. You'll tear them apart. That was yeah. my that was my point. Is yeah. that. You know, you're going to be roughly equivalent, e- either roughly equivalent or, you know, kind of two-thirds the size of the, the truly giant horde armies. And as soon as you get into combat, you'll be killing, like, 25 of them a turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's what happens if you're... It, when your army gets to grips with Goblin Town, um, they're going to be, like, 20-plus goblins going down every turn to you. I think you'd have more to worry about from a Corsair board. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but I'd, I'd be the one also playing the Corsair Horde. So it's <laughs> <laughs> you'd be in the final of the tournament against yourself, just your two armies, you right? Yeah, I would, and I would draw it. <laughs> yeah. Although I think even against the Corsair Horde, you probably have the advantage because you're you're losing roughly equal amounts of fights, but you're probably killing a bunch more figures than. Yeah, and I think that's the thing because you're going to come against Arbalisters in a Corsair Horde or even any Horde with shooting and doing here. And the Avenger Bolt aren't going to outshoot it, I think, in the long run, but they can do enough damage to kind of kill enough until they close, if that makes sense. Because they're not going to shoot at the defense seven shield walls of like Fountain Court and Minister Earth Warriors. So they can kind of hold the line and play that role until they yeah. hit. I mean, I think what you do with the Avenger Bolt Thrower, right, is like the turn you move into range with the. Um, uh, the the turn basically you, you you throw you put a couple guys in front basically in front of the Avenger bolt thrower thrower just as like an ablative shield and then it just shoots through those two guys who are in base contact and I suspect it would ju- it, it it could just mow down the arbalesters because it's wo- wounding them on fours right that's true actually yeah um yeah fours yep yep okay. Um, we'll go on to my list, which I did the only non-allied list. I thought, I'd, you know, in case someone wanted to take just pure, um, I would make a list. Um, so mine is 800 points as well. Um, it has Imrahil on ooh, horse. Ooh, ooh. Sorry. You know what you actually do with the Avenger Bolt Thrower? Sorry, and then I promise I'm done with this. <laughs> you, yeah, be you, quiet, Tim. What's your problem? I'm so, you, I'm move like, it, you move it within. You move the Bolt Thrower within, so that the Bolt Thrower is within 24 inches of the Arbalesters, and the guys are not. Ooh. <laughs> and then you open fire. Yes. All right, sorry, Tim. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that no, that makes total sense actually, because then it forces them to move forward, and then you move on in. Yeah, yeah. Um, those those little based siege weapons just have so many different shenanigans. That's why I was like the dwarf ballistas. Like I'm a huge fan. There's so many different like tricks up their sleeve and shenanigans that you could play with them. It's amazing. Oh, I forgot that they were on a small base. Oh wow. Yeah. Game changer. Um. So mine was uh, Immerhill on Horse of Lance, obviously. Uh, I have two Clansmen of Lamadon. I have seven Man-at-Arms, seven Axemen of Sarnak, two Knights of Dol Amroth with Horses and Lances. Uh, four Long on Horse with one Clansman of Lamadon, one Black Root Veil Archer with Spear. Or What do they call them? This? Are, they, are they Black Root Veil? Or what? Yeah, they're Black Root Veil Archer. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, Five men at arms, five axemen of Lasarnak, three knights of Dol Amroth with armored horse and lances, and Dwin here with 15 black root veil archers with spears. It is 51 models, eight might, and 17 bows. Wow. And then 17 can, do, can black root veil archers. So you have, you have, you have, um, he's a hero of valor. So yes. Oh, he can't. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I should have changed stuff up. Oh, 51. I'm going to change my list guys. <laughs> Uh, 51 models, 17 bows. You have five knights of Dolamroth as well. 
um, to, to try and do some damage with Emmer Hill. You have almost, I believe, almost everybody, but I believe like three foot models have spears, so you can support anything, basically. Um, and you have, you know, you, I don't know, you just have a lot of killing power with the archers. I mean, 17 shots with Dwin here. So, <laughs> you know, you call that heroic mm -hmm. accuracy with the heroic shoot, and bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything on the board, <laughs> pretty much. And, uh, you know, you, then you combine that with the, the, the very large amount of numbers, and then um, everything can support everything, basically. And you have a couple of guys, like the clansmen, where if you need to charge something terrifying, they just go, I'm in. And, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. eight my 51 models. Wow. Yeah, you brought, you brought everything. Wow. You went to the door <laughs> brief buffet, and you were like, I'm going to try a little bit of everything. But then you saw the steak of what the Black Rootville archers are, and you're like, I'm going to try that even harder. Yeah. You went back and got three servings of it. Good mm -hmm. God. 17 Black Rootville <laughs> archers with Dwayne here. <laughs> yeah, you're going to kill anything. Well, yeah. so, like the thing is, I tried to fit in another. Um, Do they have spears at least? Everybody, every, pretty much everything in the list has spears. All right, that's good. Everything, including the horses. Well, because at that yeah, point, right. your your uh, your archers are going into combat. Like, yeah, <laughs> very no, clearly they they're combat model. But that yeah. gives them like that. That gives them because like in my list, I was like doing here in the assassination squad. You have one role, take things out. Yours, it's kind of. Dual, it's dual they have two purposes of course take things out with that mega heroic accuracy but you can also throw them in to support your well my thought process is right you get into combat and you go okay so you know i've shot my shots now i'm in combat you use the black root veil archers to support behind whether that be the clansmen the uh axemen or even the man at arms because they have the fight four and the d5 these guys are only fight three and d4 so for me it makes more sense to keep them behind than it does to keep them in front just because i'd rather have the defense and most most of the the, the foot troops are uh defense five um besides the clansmen so basically you have uh and then you have five knights to just kind of go through everything with Imrahil, you know, staying in range kind of a thing. So anything within uh, Imrahil's side, just, and if you need them to go wide, of course, wherever they need to go, you can do that. But you, if you stick them together, basically anything in three inches of Imrahil is probably dead. So you mm -hmm. could, in theory, if you, if you got things well placed, you could probably take out a whole war band in one turn with just the, the cavalry in this army. Yeah. It, it, it is really good. That's nasty. 17 shots yes. from yeah. Black Root Veils. That's even, even oh, under one of them is one here. One of them is one here. Sure. But even under blinding light at that point with that many rerolls, you're like, oh, is this really going to protect me? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. The, the only downside of, um, the only downside of that with blinding light is, you know, it's like, when do I, when do I call my heroic shoot to reroll wounds? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but if somebody doesn't have blinding light and yeah. you're, you're calling heroic shoot with those guys to, to reroll wounds. And it's like, <laughs> 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 <You know? Yeah. laughs> entire yes. war bands will be going down. <laughs> in one and turn. That's no exaggeration too. Like, like I, I shot like one war band of like eight or nine of them against like hunter orcs. And I took out eight or nine hunter orcs. <laughs> yeah. Like it is disgusting. So I had an option, which I decided to go against because I'd rather, so I could have added a captain, I think on horse with Lance into this list as well, but I would have had to lose like three or four of the uh, horses. And I just decided I'd rather have the horses, but I could, you know, I, I could be persuaded either way to add the, you know, the, the extra captain for the might points plus the extra hero to do damage. Um, and the march. Yeah, the march as well. Not that um, you're doing that a lot with 17 <laughs> <no> shots. But. <laughs> so I, I ended up going with the, the knights to kind of give that cavalry <laughs> unit of like, holy crap, even when we're getting into combat, these guys are still hitting like a truck at fight five with, you know, banner reroll and plus one to wound. But I, I could, you know, I, if you guys were to say that the, the captain, I could go, yeah, that makes sense to me over, over, the, over the cavalry. And you'd still have 51 models, but because you could just downgrade them kind of a thing um, and still have the, the, the points for the, uh, the extra captain. 
but yeah, that's that's my list. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I wonder if there's a version of this that could spam out where you like have nothing but like captains and brigand. I know it would die to heroes really fast, but kind of like wondering how to make it work where you can really, really spam this out. I think you've probably done it the best that anyone's mm -hmm. probably going to do it. So that just means so much to me because I'm. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I always try to write lists. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm happy with this one, but you know, to, to get that verification just means so much. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll move on to the last one, which is Matt at a thousand. Matt at a thousand points. Okay, it's so gonna be a trebuchet. I'm calling it. You're right. Yeah, um, a trebuchet yeah. and eighty-six clansmen. Not quite. <laughs> So this oh, is shoot. this Close is a list hands. I actually took to a tournament up in Canada and did. That's why I called it. Did pretty well with <laughs> it, yeah. So Devin Devin was at that tournament. Um, so uh, uh, all right, so we'll we'll start off with the army leader, who is of course Prince Imrahil of Dol Amroth, because at a thousand points with five fins, you're taking Prince Imrahil, and of course he's on his armored horse. With him, he has four knights on four armored horses, and that's the. Uh, the fight five hitting mounted hitting power of the list and backing them up are 11 men at arms. And uh, in addition, uh, you have Dwin here uh, and Dwin here is leading eight black root. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, eight, eight black root veil archers, four of whom have spears. Uh, so that is your, that is your shooty component. Um, to the list of Dwin here and eight Black Root Vale archers. And then, and then from there you have the bells and whistles. Um, so the first bell and whistle that you, you have added on to this is the uh, battle cry trebuchet. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just with his siege veteran and, and the two guys that crew it. So there is a siege weapon in the list. Um, the next bell and whistle that you have is Iralas, captain of the guard. And with him are six warriors of Minas Tirith with sword and shield and two warriors of Minas Tirith with sword, spear, and shield. Um, so that is, your, that is part of your front line to the, uh, to the 11 uh, men-at-arms and also gets you your march in your list and it gets you your tank in your list because you've got Irilast who can just kind of walk into people and call heroic defense. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last bell and whistle that you have is Gandalf the White on Shadowfax. And Gandalf the White is leading eight warriors of Minas Tirith with sword and shield and two warriors of Minas Tirith with, with uh, spear, sword, and shield. And that is the other half of the battle line. And, of course, that is your super wizard um, that uh, ticks, ticks off the last box, um, which is uh, magic in a list. So... You've got a, a list with a um, you know, fight four or at times near Emory Hill, fight five battle line with defense seven in front. Uh, you've got a 12 inch banner with some fight five heavy cavalry uh, backing it up and a fight six hero. You've got the best wizard in the game supporting it. Uh, you have a siege weapon and then you have a battery of um, uh, Black Root Vale archers who can sit behind the cover of Gandalf's blinding light and uh, get nine shots a turn, re-rolling wounds, supporting it. So it's how many models? Like, I've got a thousand points, and it's got it's got forty eight models. So it's mm -hmm. you know pretty much on target with the uh, um, average number of models at a uh, thousand points. So um, it uh, you know it was it was an idea to see if I could. At a thousand points, you can kind of bring everything. So I was like, "Well, oh, let me see if I can come up with a list to bring everything." So this. Well, one. I mean, I mean, to have, like you said, the best wizard in the game is always just such a massive thing. I mean, everybody That's, always ex wants excuse to use. Excuse me, guys. Excuse me, guys. Radagast. <laughs> from excuse me. Radagast. The unwashed oh, wizard. Tim. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To, people, people discriminate because he smells like bird crap. But I tell you what. He's where you go. <laughs> Sorry. <to laughs> uh, I mean, Gandalf is what you wish you could have in every single list. I mean, if you were to pick a profile in the game, probably that you would want to have in every list, it would be Gandalf the White. 
because he pretty much can do everything. He can fight if he wants to. He is resistant to arrows a little bit. He has basically every spell in the game <laughs> and on very good values as well. And his horse has, you know, uh, will. And then, you know, we talked about that. And so it's, Gandalf is just awesome to have in any list. And so to fit him into this is just, it's definitely at 48 models as well. At, at a thousand too, like mm. you're going to come up against so many different armies. So like the, the, the idea of you have Gandalf, okay, this game he's blinding light. So your archers get that cover the next game. He's going to play as here and just beasting through a horde. The next game, he's mm-hmm. going to be the magic caster getting rid of fell beasts. The next game, like this is so many layers to him at a thousand mm-hmm. points. And I think that is amazing. Yeah, I think that whenever I play Gondor or Fiefdoms, if I'm going to a thousand points, it's just take my 750 point list at Gandalf. Like it's auto. Yeah, right? <laughs> right. So, and uh, I also love that he can fortify Imrahil. So if you're coming against like mm-hmm. a bunch of anti big hero magic, it's like, haha, <laughs> I'm yeah, still going to lance you. Yeah, try and figure out a try and figure out another way to stop yeah. Imrahil. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. And, yeah. So if yeah. if Tim, if yours was like the buffet. This is the Cobb salad of lists. It's got all of that in there. It's meaty. It's ready to go. So Yeah, you basically took your whole thing and they put it in a blender. Yeah. And then after it, they put whipped cream, which is Gandalf, uh, and cherry, which is Shadow Facts. And then sparkle that nasty. Sparkle. <laughs> which is Shadow Facts casting spells. <laughs> so so that that is one of the neat things about a thousand points. It's like you're not required to make to make any trade-offs, right? You mm-hmm. can, if you, yeah, you, if you do it like right, you can throw everything too. in there. Uh, it yeah, literally has everything. in there too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have like everything. I'm, I'm like, what is he missing? It no. plays in every phase of the game, even phases you didn't knew existed, right? So. <laughs> so how well did this list do? You know, I was thinking back. I can't remember. Um, I, I know I didn't win it. Um, I think... Uh, um, there you go, audience. It sucks. Yeah, <laughs> but, I, but on the other and hand, you I take back everything. Canadian. You played I, against I, Canadians too, right? I did. Uh, I, I mean, I took, I took home. Shane, I took home. <laughs> I took home a prize, though. So I think I think I podiumed. Um, but um, I, 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 I actually right. Is that the one where I brought the the three heroes, the big three heroes that got it banned? Yes. Okay, so I think it was Andrew Brock first. I was second, and then there was a, you were third. I think. Yeah, I think I think I, I, think I made two third. Americans. Yeah, because yeah, 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 there were two I, Americans. Yeah. I think in last the last game I played against a very <clears throat> unhappy Jay Call who watched his <laughs> watched his Aragorn get shot down by the Black Oh, Metal he was so sitting upset. up on a hill. Yeah, um, yeah. So I th- this was the game where I had like my block of Dwin here and the eight Black Veil archers like sitting up on this hill, like overwatching the the approach <laughs> march of the army of the dead and had like Gandalf, Gandalf was calling heroic shoot and Dwin here was calling heroic accuracy for like three. I, I think, oh. I think it only required like two turns before Aragorn went down to that. Um, she, all of us are like, Oh, <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> that tells you something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to go in for a couple of questions that people have been posting for uh, Q and a. Um, so we'll just go over those a little quick. Um, the first question is from Jordan Y. He says uh, he wants to know how we came together to create this podcast and, and how we know we want one another. Um, he says from a superficial level, it doesn't seem like we live close to each other. So I am from New York. Matt is from Boston. Devin is from Virginia. Uh, Rob, I believe you're from Virginia as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and Mick is from London. And Rainier is from Philadelphia, but he's currently in South Korea. Mm-hmm. Um, we've kind of, we, we kind of first met at, uh, I'd probably say, I probably met Matt at. Um, we all met at each other at different times and points. Yeah, it's different. Really? different, uh, different. Uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty. But we're yeah. all pretty close. Like we know each other, at least us outside of Mick, because he's in the UK. Mm-hmm. All of us know each other quite well, I'd say. I mean, Tim and I, got the same hotel at one of the Nova's like Devin and I have driven to Canada for events. Um, Rob, I usually ignore Rob cause I don't like him. So like there's True. all these different, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what the problem is, is because Rob doesn't have quite the same beard shape as you and Tim. Mm. I mean, That's that true. was really, I mean, I, I know that Rainier, you and Tim kind of bonded over beards. 
It's um, true, actually. It is so true. I guess, well, I guess give, me, remain... give me five minutes. I can take care of that right quick. So. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, re- the real thing is Tim and I can't grow. Yeah, very <laughs> much. Very <laughs> so much. we bond over the lack. Basically. The lack of. Yeah. And Rob, they have, never, Rob, they have never forgiven you for that. <laughs> Nor well, should they. I, say, Rob, I, I completely like. I built a list to just shoot you out of oblivion because I'm just so angry. You come so on this angry. podcast and you have a fully fit beard. How dare you? Yeah, who do yeah. you think you are? Mick doesn't even go fully beard. Just come putting that right in front of us. <laughs> this is the episode of sidetracking on. <laughs> oh. You know, but, uh, Lanier, don't don't forget. <laughs> it's not the beard on the outside. It's on the beard on the inside that counts. Well, that's, true. That pain. that's true. When you have a beard that's on true. the inside. <laughs> It is its condition. Yeah. Does nobody here. else have that? Am I uh, am I in trouble here? <laughs> so let, let's let's see. How if, if we were, all, if we, we were we all met basically, I'd say we all like converged at Devin's. Uh, well, Devin's sort of. Tournament. Yeah, I'm I'm making a little bit of a timeline here because I think there actually is a, a an order which we all met each other because I don't think Rob when we met what was what year was it twenty two thousand. Uh, uh, it was that. it was like either the year of or the year right before the first Nova because we met when the DCHL was starting and kind of yeah. did Nova together, right? What, yeah, what year you, is that for for preference for for years? What year is that? So I'm that's what I'm trying like, to get the. It was like what 14 or 15? Yeah, 1923. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. So, um, I think the first joining yeah was probably me and Rob. And mm-hmm. for those who don't know, Rob is actually one of the starting members of the DCHL along with um, Walker and uh, also um, Alex Wright. Alex Wright, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, which a lot of people don't know that Alex Wright actually mm-hmm. founded the DCHL. Uh, well, he exactly. was our terrain guy. So yeah, he was. It was actually me and Alex um, constantly going to places. So mm-hmm. um, Rob took place more along with Walker with the YouTube channel, where that's how. The YouTube channel actually started, and, and for those who don't know, Rob wasn't in any of the episodes, but he did voice the Gondor episode. Mm-hmm. So, but he was kind of in the shop. And uh, tell me if I'm getting any of the history with you wrong. I think because um, you were kind of like a background. Helper. Well, so I um I I didn't really take too much part in a lot of the public stuff like the YouTube. Like I did a lot of yeah. the behind the scenes stuff. But essentially, you know, you had come to the Springfield store because either somebody linked us up or we had met some other way and we were like, Oh, Hey, we all love Florida of the rings. This is fantastic. Let's, and we all listen to the GBHL. So let's start yeah. the DCHL and have our own thing and our own tournaments and all that. Um, and a website and events. And, um, and then we created um, chaos and Arda because we were like, we need to have a fun mini game. And so this was like early, early proto everything. And it kind of culminated with, um, doing the first Nova together, which turned out to be way more successful than I think any of us expected. Yeah, none be, of us expected huge, it right? to be that. Well, um, the and that kind of kicked off everything, right? I think it's GBHL came. That 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 was a big reason. I think it it went it, a lot more. Yeah, getting the expected. publicity from um, from what at the time were the four main kind of uh, GBHL channel guys: Tom, Damian, um, James, and Jamie. That was that was really great. Also kicked off a whole bunch of friendships across the Atlantic, right? But yeah, yeah, so me and you me and you met essentially about a year out, started the CHL, and then we're like, let's do Nova. I was like, okay, let's do Nova. I know the people and you can do all the stuff and the rest is history. And now we're then, married. Yeah. Ma- yeah, basically. <laughs> so happy, happy guys. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's happy. Too bad uh, Rob's part of that sister husband's club because he also has other spouses. But I then do. Matt, would you... <laughs> All bearded, by the way. Oh, right here, he doesn't don't know trigger that me yet. again, guys. You keep triggering me. Come on, man. Don't no, even but say nothing's that word. happening. Don't worry about Rob. He's he's fine. He's but, a, yeah, yeah. I think the next meeting was with Matt. I think yeah, Matt well, came to know. So no, how did that? Yeah, it was you? before Nova, right? It was it was at his. Where we first met at Historicon. Oh yes, that's mm-hmm. right. That's right. Um, which was, you know, I I had been a historical player and, um, you know, had been trying to get Evan interested in historical gaming but he what he really loved was the the fantasy stuff and he played some fantasy games at uh historicon historicon by the way is like the big historical miniatures yeah. tournament that's run in the country uh and that that's run in various places it's, it's been in pennsylvania it's been um in the dc area um and that particular year uh, evan evan had also um 
you know, he lo- at that point, Evan and I had gotten into, I'd gotten Evan into Lord of the Rings. So he was playing Lord of the Rings and he, you know, he loved that. Um, and, but nobody around us played it. Um, and then when we were going down to historic on that year, I happened to be like paging through the, 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 you know, the, the convention guide for Historicon, and I saw that there's this guy, Devin Moreno, who's actually running a Lord of the Rings tournament. Mm-hmm. And I immediately emailed him and said, hey, can we get in? Can, you know, is, there, is there space in your tournament? Um, and uh, yeah, Devin said, yeah. And uh, we met at, at that Historicon where he was kind of running a, a, a kind of quasi tournament games there. And, um, and, and I think it, it, this, this was kind of your baptism in fire and how like historical conventions work. If yeah. I remember correctly. I, it was, I actually fully did not understand yeah. the, uh, the environment. What was it? I messed up something pretty big. Uh, so, oh, you like, like, so you had all your local players showing up and you, you hadn't explained to them because I think you didn't realize that, uh, you know, at, at a place like Historicon, that is, you know, basically a mob scene of historical players. You have to, re- I mean, you have to register for the tournament and register oh, for yeah, events right. in advance. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, like you, you had a bunch of your local players showing up, and they were like closed out of the games because. Yeah, we got a bunch of random people, mm-hmm. right? Like coming into the event, and I was just like, I don't know what to do here. Yeah, well, and, and the other thing I don't think you fully understood was that the people who sign up for games at places like Historicon have no idea what the rules are. Right. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. expecting to show up and be like, you know, taught a fairly simple set of rules and, and play. Yeah. And, it's more of like a theme at Historicon. Mm-hmm. Like you, yeah. you see different ter- events and you're like, I want to play in that. And they're like, okay, here are some dice. They even sometimes provide the army and you play. Whereas the Lord of the Rings is like, we've come for blood. Remember, <laughs> That's right. We had to slash down the rules considerably. Like we were like, I, I can't remember which one because I remember there was a Pelennor Fields one that was a boat battle. We kept like right. bringing it down. Like we were like, all right, this. We is- actually <laughs> had we had a really fun boat game, if I remember, because there are a couple of my friends that my historical yeah. friends that ended up playing in that, and we had slashed down a bunch of the rules, but we had a lot of fun like mucking around in boats with. Uh, with you know Corsair figures and mm-hmm. and Minas Tirith figures and like you know ramming each other and uh, <laughs> and then boarding the ships and uh, uh, yeah so that was a lot of fun so that, and that was like that was a couple months before Nova and then we showed up to Nova and uh, played there as, as well with my mm-hmm. um, my then I think ten year old son Evan 10. and that's where I met you Matt and Evan so right it was the first right. Nova. And were were you the one who played Evan in the 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 Clash of Champions tournament, or was that somebody else? Probably not, because I um I was doing all of the judging and scorekeeping yeah. and stuff. So yeah. I don't think I played any games. I was I think I played a few Ringer games, but I don't. Yeah. You, well, yeah. you played in the Mordor's Arena. Yeah, I ran like, the Mordor's oh, Arena. Then. Yeah. yeah. Which we regretted immediately ever hosting. We were like, never this again. It was fun. You know what? We didn't we didn't know what people would want and we got a good turnout, but we did. Um, we got a really was, good turnout. It was a mess. So <laughs> but hey, we had fun. Yep. Um, and so then the next in line comes Tim. Oh well, actually, so quick backtrack because Mick's not here. So for those who don't know Mick, Mick is actually um, uh, from England. Well, no, okay, he's technically from yeah. Poland, but then moved to England, and I regard him as being from England. I met Mick virtually, uh, probably even further than before I met Rob. I met him back when I was like a kid, almost like fourteen years old or something. I forgot what age I was, and uh, he w- he wrote a blog called Black Mist Blog. And he was on the forums where Tim Hickson is, is actually Dam- Damien O'Byrne. You can see him, Dr. Grant is on the one ring and, yeah. and last lines farms. And, and so that's where we call kind of met each other in a virtual or never each other's faces. You and met then, on the internet is what you're saying. No, just a virtual world. <laughs> <laughs> totally yes, not the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah right. Not, not the same. <laughs> the internet. So we met over the internet and, um, and then what was it? I'm trying to figure out the first time we met, uh, I met Mick in person was I was at Articon. So actually I may have met Tim before this, but I was at Articon and me and Damien were having a game and we were actually in the doubles. It was me and this, uh, my partner versus Tom Harrison and Damien O'Byrne. And, and then, you know, Mick comes up to the table and he's like, is this legends colliding? And he started taking pictures of us playing our game. We were just being silly. That's when I learned, like, oh, you're Mick, the blackness guy who read Dolan's blogs. And so 
kicked into a conversation. And from there, every time I visit England, England, I, uh, especially if I'm in London where he's based, I go visit him. So, um, a lot of times I'll, I'll visit, like, you know, we go to Twickenham for seven stones tournament or something like that. So that's Mick. That's the story of him. And then it was Tim after that, I believe. Um, because we get you at the second Nova, right? Yeah. Oh, it would be Mick. It would be Tim and Rainier then at the same time. Yeah, I was time. gonna say. I think, well, I think we, yeah. we showed at the same time with our. Oh my gosh! And we were like, hey. I had the most. <laughs> all right, so from another mother. <laughs> Rainier, we're gonna get to you because your story with me and how I first met you is so oh, tragic. That it was so tragic. So I was tragic. so it was... bummed, but I got I got the last like. And we knew you didn't time. understand what was going on. Well, sh- sh- should I should I share? I guess I guess we can. Yeah, go. It's a safe, I, it's I, a safe space right here. Nobody's listening. Yeah, yeah go. Ahead. Are yeah, you no, sure? Yeah, it, it was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and share. Okay, so I had always watched like the DCHL because I, I lived in Texas. Well, I, I was always always into the game from once it's, once it began. But first, I lived in Tennessee. I was a teenager. I never went to events or even played the game. Then I moved to Texas. I was too busy to travel to play it. And my area in Texas, El Paso, nobody played it. So I could play with a cactus, but you wouldn't really get much exposure with a cactus to getting better. So I actually had never played the game until I moved to Pennsylvania to start grad school. And I was like, okay, so I've watched year after year these British sons of guns come in, take first, second, and third every single year. Cause of course I watched the blog. Like I love the GBHL and stuff or the YouTube vlog blogs. And I was like, you know what? America needs some heroes. I'm going to go. And, <laughs> and I was, I was like, it's my goal. I'm going to actually get into the game. And actually this is actually not many, many of you guys know this, but um, I'm an anthropologist and I did my dissertation on tabletop war gaming also. So I studied how globalization is happening through games, how the, the notion of culture, society, and just community is changing, um, of course, pre-COVID. But yeah, so I came into the, to the, my, first, my first ever game. I played a Canadian, I think, from the West Coast, my first game. I lost five to three, so a minor loss. And then I proceeded to win 12-0 the next four games in a row. Boom, 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 boom. For like those were my first five games. And I had no idea what a tournament was or like how to how the scoring and stuff happens or anything like that. And this is where like some you you share what happened. So, so it was if I pretty tragic. Correctly, it was very tragic. It was bad. But me, Adam Troke, this was the year Adam Troke, myself, George Nicotitis, and I believe one of the person was judging. And you, on the second round, had won your game, but recorded it. I think this it. was the third third round. Was it? I'm pretty sure it was the second, but it might have been the third. It was early. Well, it was one early. Of them, pretty, yeah. The, you the were, judge had recorded because I won 12 yeah. 0. The judge had recorded that I lost. The scorekeeper. Oh. What well, was a scorekeeper? Score, scorekeeper. Yeah. You lost. And this is where the first year where I realized that the scorekeeper can't do anything else other than scorekeeping, it's like one of the most delicate jobs because it, it really crushed your event. So you you were recorded as a loss. And normally what we do at the first day of Nova, at the end of the day, we say, here's the scores. Only three rounds had gone by at that point. And so we're like, please verify it's correct. We'll go through it and I'll throw it up on the screen now. But I think that Nova we did or did not? I'm not no, sure. You, I don't think you I don't guys think so. I don't think we had the projector yet. And so we hadn't done that. And so maybe it was a computer screen where you could ask, but it wasn't encouraged. Um, and yeah. so you just and I had no idea like tournament scoring or anything like that. I yeah. was just like, I, I, I just come to play the so game. So it was totally like, not your America's fault. America's honor against these British barbarians. Like that's my only goal. So because Rainier was recorded as a loss, despite his paperwork was correct, it was actually the scorekeeper who made the mistake. Um, the paperwork was correct and uh, he was recorded as a loss, which means he, he dropped down because he was recorded as a 12-0 loss. So he fired far down the tables. Now now people know, and Rainier didn't know at this time, but now people yeah. know your table numbers are your scorekeeper, essentially. You know yeah. if you're dropping down yeah. in tables. And, and, and y'all, 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 y'all were talking about submarining and stuff, and I was so confused. I was like, I thought this was Lord of the Rings. Like, what are you talking about, submarines? <laughs> and like, like, this is not historical war gaming. Like, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. But yeah. like, in hindsight, it makes total sense. But I was... Again, my first game playing, yeah, of course, see. like first first like game playing <laughs> so, was at a tournament and stuff, so I had no idea what was going on. I was like, so me, it was 
I remember it was like me, Adam Trope, Tim McKnight, and Jacob Hall sat down with you, and we were trying to explain to you because you had won all your games, and you were like, "Shouldn't I have podium?" Because I would have gotten like, third. You would have got third place, and I, I was like, "You, you didn't get third place. You were denied the opportunity to get third place because all of your opponents, for anyone who's watching this, you know, all of his opponents were now bottom tier players. So he beat." players theoretically who would have been on a lower tier because he had won all his games. He should have been against the higher players. So the players who actually got first, second, third beat higher level players than he did. So it wasn't necessarily that he deserved third. It's just, we recorded in such a manner where he could never even podium. Like he, he never was op- given that opportunity. You know, we tried to rectify as best we could. You know, Adam Troke was like, you know, I think he offered you some prizing. Um, yeah, I and, and so we knew you didn't answer. want the prizes. Oh, don't, like, don't cry. Nothing, you want this prize? No, no. We, there was <laughs> yeah, nothing they're, they're, they're we could like, do they're like, because we, we knew what he wanted was future. the glory. Yeah, yeah. here's a cupcake. <laughs> here's a cupcake. Okay, it'll make it better. It'll make I, it better. And I was like, I don't want the cupcake. Give me the sword. What I want is revenge. Yeah, he wanted the glory, and, <laughs> and I came back next year and I won. But no, but see, <laughs> that was the thing that actually really impressed me because um, I was for sure like when I when you asked me one final favor, you were like, look. Can you just post on social media that you actually did win? And I and I told you no. I'm like I can't do that because it's I wanted not that glory, true. Guys. I wanted you just the wanted glory. the glory. We couldn't give you anything. I was we, like, we it's just, my first time. Yeah. I want to make a point. <laughs> and so I told you no, and I'm like, man, this kid is never coming back to know ever again. You know, like, this came makes back and won. so much sense why Rainier hates me because I missed the second Nova because I went on my honeymoon and I was not there as the scorekeeper and judge to <laughs> save sure him from this. Set, yeah. And he has never <laughs> forgiven me. That's what it is. So, wait a second. Was this the Nova that I won? Was this the it, one where I played Troke? It, I think it was the mm-hmm. one that you played Troke. Well, no, no, no. Troke was a judge. It was a third Nova. I think this okay. was Tom yeah. Harrison. The sec- the, no, no. Right. I think it was Troke. Tom Harrison. I yeah. Think I think you're right. It was whatever one he was at a judge. He was a judge at. He was helping his judge. So I just I remember it because it was that distinctive because Adam. Right, was trying I, I to just get wanted to make sure that my win wasn't sullied by this. <laughs> no, no. It was. I think it was the third one. I, I don't. I don't remember. Maybe it was the fourth one. But um, I know the next year the Rainier came back and kicked kicked butt. So, um, so yeah, it was actually pretty impressive to watch because he came back and I was like, I can't screw this score up again. But honestly, from then on out, it was that incident that really had us revise how we keep track of the scores and how we go over them. And now at Nova, you're not allowed to talk to the scorekeeper. We usually have someone posted in front of her and they, they, they gather the scores and we get, and we try to make sure she's absolutely, and it's usually a sheet. So it so happens, but you know, um, but basically the person doing the scorekeeping is like, you, you can't talk to them, approach them, do anything. We always try to make sure everyone else is, uh, it's just to keep them totally undistracted. And I really emphasize, like, to the scorekeepers now, I'm like, look, these people paying, like, $1,000. You calculate, you know, plane tickets and hotels to come to this tournament. You cannot mess this up. <laughs> like, you have to really have this right, um, which is why, like, Articon fixed it by having you input your own scores. They, you know, I'm like, fourth or fifth Articon. They now have a computer software. Of course, I can't do that because there's no Wi-Fi mm-hmm. in Nova. So there wasn't yeah. really a Wi-Fi at Articon either, to be fair. Yeah, not but, really. Yeah, yeah, we overwhelmed the heck out of it. So. But, but that that's kind of like how I met I met the whole crew, I guess, on a negative. <laughs> You you met us in a negative light. But 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 then then I was like, okay, I live on the East Coast. I've never I've always wanted to play the game. There's all these tournaments mm-hmm. popping up. And then I went to Matt's tournament, Shadow in the East, in uh, Rhode Island. And I played, I think they had that was my second event that I played at. And that's where I met Tim, because that's where I played Tim. No, we met at the first Nova. Did we? We, play, we played against each other. At the you, first Nova. No, he wasn't there on the first Nova. No, the second Nova I meant. The second, the second. Oh, okay. No, I don't think we played against each other because I played like I lost my first you game. Had, and I won four. You had a Harad list and I, I had... sec- wait, no, because the first the first year I, 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 I'm not sure the listeners wait. care about this level. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Question is when did we meet each other? <laughs> We're trying to maybe, be as maybe accurate as possible, that. man. The, because the, the, you the, had you had um I, I think I remember this. I had uh, a ridiculous 
Maybe. Well, you know what? Maybe it was. All right. Next. Next question. (laughs) (laughs) I don't. I don't know that I have time for a next question. Yeah. Much, but. Um. um, But yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I guess you met us at a Nova as well. It's either Nova or Matt's tournament. I met. And then I met Matt at Matt's tournament. I met Devin at Nova, and then. I've never actually met Rob, but we've spoken obviously on the podcast. So we, we've clearly, uh, we've clearly been in the same room at the same event, but never actually really linked yeah. up until yes. this. I think so. that's on purpose, to be to honest. I mean, I'm actually not on this podcast, so no one really cares how I met you anyway. So <laughs> and then Mick was the same thing, where like you know we met him on the podcast, so that that's pretty much the story. Yeah. But um, real quick, basically how the podcast got started, and then we'll get into the next one. Um, I came up with the idea because I, I was th- I was listening. Uh, it was during COVID. It was probably about May, I think, of last year, right? And um, I texted. I, I was listening to podcasts, and I thought to myself, I was like, everybody's doing podcasts nowadays, but there really isn't anybody doing Lord of the Rings podcasts. So I said to Devin, I was like, Hey, Devin, would you want to do a podcast with you know and and talk about things? And and Devin specifically wanted it to be about competitive things. So then I was like, okay. So then, uh, you know, I said, do we, you know, can we do like a five to six person podcast kind of thing? And, he, you know, he was like, yeah. And so, I, you know, I said the, the first two people that came to my mind were Rainier and Matt. And, um, you know, that was fine. And then um, Devin had mentioned that he really wanted to get Mick on because, you know, he, he said he knew a lot. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Him, but yeah, sure. And then that's kind of how the whole thing kind of started was, you know, I wanted Matt and, and Rainier, and then so did Devin, of course. And then he wanted um, Mick, and then, you know, that's just kind of how it all started. And we just said, you know, hey, if you guys are interested, you know, we're going to be doing this fairly frequently. So if you guys are okay with that, then we'll just do a podcast together. And we'll talk about random things on competitive-wise. It was actually tried it kind of hard to get exactly who we wanted on the podcast. We had a list of, like, 12. Yeah, I, I think we, we got yeah pretty big list and we were kind of like all right who is actually going to be available for this or who, who would be interested wow well, do you hear that matt we're only on this podcast because we were available <laughs> yeah. uh, you were the top two on my list actually actually to be honest matt iverson was the top on both of our lists and then you you were also on the top of like both of our lists i actually which is of course could, what they would say even if we were 11th and 12th <laughs> no, 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 no. they asked like everybody they so, even asked people like it's okay guys at least you're not 13th like so, this guy <laughs> <laughs> so rob i actually remember we we brought up your name and we were like i think he won't be available because yeah, we yeah, we yeah yeah we were like he's not going to be available yeah. for us. So also at the time i know you no were you're, you're absolutely right um but at y- the y- time y- you were starting it my schedule would not have allowed mm-hmm. it right at yeah. least and not in a regular way y- yeah, y'all wanted to get like the really competitive players who were like placing exactly. events and stuff we wanted to get people who regularly placed that that was the goal so not people who are competitive but people who consistently and we had even considered canadians um trying to get them on wow board, even canadians know. Even them, yeah, oh we beat that low. Don't, don't speak <laughs> so low. We had, we had, we had a, like, we, love, want we love all so Canadians on here. <laughs> we, we had a brief period where, like, because we, we, because Mick was coming in, it was like, I wonder if we do like an international thing where we get like someone from yeah. here, here, and here, kind of a thing. Because well, I know Andrew Brock was a big consideration, and then Ben McClinsky, but yeah, he, he has a child or two kids. But, uh, but yeah, there was a lot of names we had thrown around. There was just like. Who's really actually a thing. It really what it came down to is I messaged everyone and then uh, I, I you know I responded. We did who responded <laughs> first really. It, it really <laughs> didn't come down to that. It, it really <laughs> like we, we we got I messaged Rainier and then I messaged Matt and both of you basically said yes and then you know we messaged I messaged a couple other people and nobody got back to me mm-hmm. and then uh, Devin was like you know what there's this guy named Mick let's let's get him on and. And so then, you know, Mick responded and then, you know, I got a couple of people respond a little bit later, but at that point we already had the cast, you know, everybody was already set. Um, but yeah. Who, uh, well, I'm curious after this episode, guys, I'm going to be asking you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we'll go on to um, another question. We'll get that one done. You and, think we can do it in nine minutes? Yeah, it's, it's a relatively uh, right. quick one. Right. Um so it's from Joshua DeVoy. He asks, what are expectations for the first few tournaments coming out of lockdown are going to be like? Um, you know, what are the rule? You know, uh, he had a lot of fun with fairly chaotic armies and the rules updates and trying out new things. He says, do we, do we think we'll see a lot of strange random armies or, you know, we'll, 
people feel like and, and how does certain armies metas develop fairly quickly. And so basically what, what, what do you guys think of the tournament scene is going to be like when, when things go back to normal? I think, it's I think gonna folks are going to try to try to like play different things like that came out. So mm -hmm. things like different legions that came out that you didn't really see play out that much um, because of COVID. Um, so that that's what I think when it comes to gets quirky lists or whatever. I still think you're going to have people at the major events take what they're comfortable with because they want to win. But at local events and anything like that's not super mm -hmm. super competitive. I think folks are just going to bring what they play bring what they want to play you yeah. i've seen this actually in new jersey events they've been having uh new jersey events and a lot of what people are bringing aren't quirky lists like let me try to make this work but theme lists like ents dunland easterlings different lists like that so i think i think you'll see some of that i'm pretty much expecting all siege towers <laughs> Two siege towers playing against each other. Signal what? towers, right? right? Signal, oh, yeah, towers. signal what, towers. That's Sorry, what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> All signal towers. Um, I, I, yeah, I think we've had what the Rohan at war. Did that come out during the lockdown, or just? Uh, I think Quest All of the right. Ring Bearer came out right before lockdown, which right? didn't really add enough to change the meta. Then you had two FAQs, which did change the meta, but only in very small ways, like the the bombs now. So. You, you won't see as much of the siege bombs and um, the latest meta. What was the big controversial thing in it? Because there's been a controversial thing in every FAQ now at this point. Oh yeah, the horses. So that's one thing that I think might change a little bit. You might see a slight increase in ring ranks now, knowing that black darts are mm -hmm. you can't be you can't stop them. Which interesting decision there. But you know, we'll see what uh, impacts the tournament. Thing. I think we're going to really see the um, Dragon Cult Acolyte meta spring up now. Oh, dude, that's so. going to be everywhere. The Dragon Cult Acolyte's going to be an all army list now. Mm -hmm. People are going to go impossible from good alliances to try to get these things in. Mm -hmm. Just because I want to see these guys like bounce down the table. <laughs> boing, 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 boing. Mm -hmm. you, you, um, you ever see those like monsters where like they, they crawl with their hands? That They're going to just be doing handstands the whole time. <laughs> I think I think it's a long story short. I don't think we any of us expect the meta to change drastically. I think that people theorized and all that. You might see a few things, but like keep in mind, I'm not even sure we fully knew what the meta was before the lockdown. The game had been out for two years, maybe. And yeah. No, I think this, the meta, this would make a good yeah. conversation because I know my Philly group and I have this discussion all the time when we just do hobby chats. Yeah. Each region has their own meta. And I think that's yeah, the beauty so. of the game is each region thinks something works and then you come up against and it's not the meta that wins a game when you put them against each other. It's the player. So I think it's the same. There's so many metas within the game that you're just going to add like there's say, let's say 20 metas like the new, the new rules and armies. You're just going to add one or two metas to the 20. So now there's 22, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, it's, I think it's going to be one of those things where you're going to get, see the mostly competitive people be competitive but i do think there will be a, a larger increase in themey more fun armies at tournaments so you know if, if there's a 30 person tournament i'm going to imagine maybe only 10 people are there competitively and the other 20 are just going to be there for fun and taking right. you know whatever they want that mm -hmm. things that just came out like rainier said or something that looks you know that they saw or, or made a list that thinks would be <clears> fun because like they just want to get started off on a good note rather than a competitive note mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, a lot of the Quest of the Ring Bearer stuff that's kind of funky and fun, like the Black Riders, people will play that at small events to try it out and have fun with it. But at the big events, whenever they come back, um, you're probably going to see pretty much the same styles of armies that people have been bringing until another supplement comes and torpedoes it or something like that, or FAQ. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't think folks miss winning. I think folks miss playing. I think folks will come and bring themey lists because mm -hmm. they, they, they prioritize. I miss playing with my buddies at like a 30, 40 man tournament where we all have amazing painted models. And I think folks are going to come with like what they painted more than their court, than their different like tricks of like, Ooh, I'm going to like conquer with this little trick. It's going to be more like, look what I painted over COVID mm -hmm. and here's what I want to present to and have fun with it with my buddies. That's true. I think a lot of armies will come out that like people wanted to paint just didn't have time. Yep. Look at the 50 Rangers of Athelion that I painted over COVID. <laughs> Look at the 120 ruffians. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the literal nothing I have painted during COVID. So. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Alex Wright painted some of my armies. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I know uh, Devin's probably going to have to hop off here. Uh, we'll do one more question afterwards. Um, and we'll just do that real quick. So uh, I'd be like, who is Devin? Why do you guys even work with him? He just, he just, <laughs> he just basically, he just like did the thing where it's like he didn't hang up on you. He, he notioned to you like, motioned you hang up on me and you better do so. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a bold move tim like straight gangster enjoy it yeah <laughs> all right, I am bye Devin. Adios. Bye. um all right so we'll go into the last question for today um it is by joe heron and his question is what are some of the favorite heroic actions to chain together and or to utilize mm. in effective combinations Hmm. Interesting. I think okay. one. Right I was. I saw bat. this and I thought to myself, I was like, "This is a very interesting thing to combine together." One right off the bat would be throwing weapons with a heroic march, is something that I like to kind of just like use. It can be effective in a combination. You heroic march with one one hero up, and then you can um, heroic shoot maybe to to outshoot your opponent or something like that. So that's so yeah, I'd say a march with a shoot. Is an interesting one. Um, we talked about it earlier with with Matt Matt's list, uh, heroic accuracy with a heroic shoot. Um, well, I mean, yeah. the, the the classic is heroic strike and heroic combat, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, where you move two heroes into the same guy. One calls a heroic strike, the other calls a heroic combat, um, and then you kill that one guy, and your guy that heroic struck mm -hmm. can then. Um, you know, if he's got op he's got all sorts of opportunities to go into other heroes that he now has a higher fight value than and mm -hmm. and take them out. So that mm -hmm. that can cause all sorts of when you manage to pull one of those off, it can cause all sorts of problems for the other player because the other players like do I do I call the 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 prophylactic heroic strike with all my guys that aren't 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 in combat now but could end up in combat with this hero after the heroic combat goes off. Um, and uh, so that can, that can cause a lot of damage. I think that's probably the number one ability to chain. I agree with that. Yeah, I'd say so too. You see that a lot with yeah. a lot of uh, well-rounded, uh, I guess, players use it a lot. And if you're, if, you, if you're pretty good too, like you know to be aware of it when you see two heroes together, you're like, okay, they're, they're going to do this. Let me protect protect my guy, and it even like throws people off balance because you can heroic strike and heroic combat in the same in the same thing. And then like let's say you have a general who would be outfought, then you're like shoot, I'm gonna heroic strike also in case they combat into me, and then they could decide just to ignore him and combat into someone else, and you wasted a might. So it is it is it is quite like. Quite if good. um remind me because this gets into a bit of a nitty gritty of the rules when you if you have two heroes that both call her a combat um they both resolve but you can only move once as a result of a combat right right so you can resolve on combat move and then the other combat would trigger and even though they couldn't move it would go first and so well, you could do some stuff there right yeah so you can daisy chain heroic combat yeah and the way you do this is you have like say say you have three heroes who all hit you know enemy heroes or yeah. enemy figures or something like that. And um, what you can do is you can call heroic combat, say with like all three of them. Mm -hmm. And you would, you pick one, you resolve that, assuming you kill yeah. your opponent, then that guy moves into the second heroic combat mm -hmm. um, and fights there at the time of the second heroic combat. So before all the rest of the yeah. combats, assuming you win that one, which you ought to, because now you've got two heroes mm -hmm. on whatever figure was in there. Um, then the, the hero that called the second heroic combat can then move again. The one that's already moved in a heroic combat can't That's right. Yeah. Can continue to move. So he stays there. But then the second one moves, he can move into the third heroic combat and do the same thing again. Yeah. Um, so it's a way, you know, if you wanna if you wanna make sure that you have uh, you know, kind of two heroes on one in your second and third mm -hmm. heroic combats, there's a way to do that. Yeah, and um, uh, you see that a lot with um, rangers lists, like actual Dunedain rangers lists, because they're all heroes, and you chain the combats. Um, so that's an interesting, like linked, linked heroic as well. Yep. Um, there, there's some more esoteric ones you can do. Like, well, I, I mean, 
one thing I guess we should talk about here is the the sacrificial heroic combat where um, like somebody like an Alendil moves into your captain and is, mm-hmm. and, you know, he causes fray heroic combat. And what he's going to do is he's going to eat your captain. Um, and then uh, uh, he's going to turn around and heroic combat into something else. And what your, your captain can do to try and forestall that is call his own heroic combat. Um, mm-hmm. Hope that on the 50, 50 die roll, his heroic combat goes first. He's still going to die, but at least then Alendil doesn't get to move into something mm-hmm. else. Uh, an interesting variant of this that I think I've only pulled off once, but you can you can do in the right circumstances, is if you have if you have your two guys go in to to somebody, um, and you know you don't have a heroic strike or you don't want to call a heroic strike. If you're trying to forestall that opponent's heroic combat, like Alendil's heroic combat someplace else, you can call a heroic combat and a heroic defense with yep. your two heroes, and then take your guy that called the heroic defense and put it into the heroic combat of uh, the, uh, the Alendil. So all of a sudden now Alendil's got to kill two figures, mm-hmm. one of which is a hero that called heroic defense. So his heroic combat probably isn't going off at that point. Yeah. I, I actually did that. Um, I believe it was at Articon with Erolas where I called a defense and then heroic him off of a warrior into Aragorn to just stop Aragorn. So I, you know, this one doesn't get used at all because obviously nobody really has these two. I've always enjoyed the heroic shoot, heroic accuracy combination personally. And, you know, like, and and maybe this is more prevalent to me because I mostly deal with blinding light and bows, but, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to get something behind the lines and, and just know that a huge amount or a large amount of something is going to hit that specific thing. I just, I love the combination of going, you know, basically I have another version of Legolas to an extent where I'm going, I'm going to hit that one thing, you know, so if you, if you need to hit that fell beast and you go, okay, well, I need to be hitting the rider, not the, the fell beast kind of a thing, then you can go, okay, you know, I'm going to call her and I, let, let's pretend I was Harad or something and, and I'm going, you know, I'm going to shoot at that person, you know, I've got half of these are going to hit and then half of these are going to hit the rider and then I'll re-roll, so then nine shots are hitting the rider, and then they re-roll if you had the betrayer. So it just becomes one of those things. I, I very much enjoy the heroic combat, heroic um, shoot combination. But I, I, you, mean hero- just- you mean heroic shoot, heroic accuracy? Yes, heroic <laughs> shoot, heroic accuracy. Yeah, I, I think it's even like worse than uh, legless, because legless is going to like get a cheeky wound. Like, But if you have the heroic accuracy, heroic shoot, you're going to get a potential... like. Nine, ten cheeky wounds. Like you know what I mean. Like it's, well, it's 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 pretty good. Well, I mean, I guess I question the utility of that in situations other than with the Black Root Vale archers who get a tangible combat benefit from from being subject to a heroic shoot. I mean, they're the only guys that get to reroll the wound. Everybody else just we no, shoot first. Uh, Haradrim with the betrayer. Yeah, but still, I mean, they're they're shooting first and yeah well, i mean some, could... sometimes that matters right i mean sometimes it matters to shoot first but most of the time really if you shoot first what you're what you're probably getting is just maybe an extra kill or two um, i think about it like this so imagine you're going up against um somebody who has horses right so let's say you went against somebody who has three heroes who are on horses or you, they have a bunch of supports that you just don't want to deal with. So let's say they give the bonus. So let's say you have the elves with the dwarves that we talked about earlier on in the episode, right? So you go, okay, well, I can fight these guys if I can get rid of this. So maybe you call the, um, the heroic accuracy with uh, the re-rolling kind of a thing. And then you hit all those back rank people. And then maybe you only kill four, but you've now killed four very important parts to that army, or you take off the horses of a couple of heroes, so I, I, I love the combination of the two. And especially with shoot, you know, sometimes that ability to kill. Like, I just think about it like this. If you well, went up shoot, against. Shoot's only going to matter if you're in a gun duel, right, Tim? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're trying to shoot guys off no, course. Yeah, if, you if, if you're only, yes. at the end of the turn, at the end of the phase instead of at the beginning of the phase. Shoot, shoot you're right. Shoot only matters in a, a gun war. And, but, you know, a lot of armies are taking 12 plus bows. And, you know, they might not outshoot something like Harad, but if you had another army, 
let's say, that had 12 bows, maybe that is more relevant to take out their archers. But, I mean, it's less so than other armies. I, I get what you're saying. It, it, it's, it's not nearly as relevant as accuracy, but even accuracy isn't as relevant. But I just like the combination. Yeah. So, well, so there's one more combination that I guess I'd like to interject, and that's the, the heroic march, heroic move combination. Yeah. Yep. Which really you see principally in one situation, and that's when you're playing seize the prize. And you need, you know, it's whoever gets to that, whoever gets that 12 inches to the mm-hmm. middle, had, you know, suddenly becomes the favorite to win the game, although not all the time because sometimes and especially if it's me you'll then proceed to roll one through three for the next four turns to get mm-hmm. the prize he's but, not lying guys like it's exactly what happened when we play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, and funny. by the way i can't tell you how many times that's happened to me um you told you too you, you were like you know what this always happens to me <laughs> I was like, no. yeah. like, why do i even bother showing up here first yeah <laughs> like matt wasn't even phased like other players would be like oh come on bad luck. but you were like oh this makes sense <laughs> yeah that's right this is you not know, really i need to I like a challenge <laughs> well i need to change my strategy in that scenario i need to let the other guy get there first because he's the only one i know who will actually dig up the prize and then i can just try and take it from him <laughs> um but uh so you just you have to be very careful about how you set that up. So if you're if you're gonna set up a heroic march heroic move combination, you need to make sure that both heroes that are calling are essentially gonna be in the front rank. Um because the heroic move has the, the way this works is the heroic and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, because I always have to like think this through in my head. The heroic move guy goes first and he crawl and he says with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he moves as far as he can forward. And then the heroic march guy goes next. And he says, with me. And he moves as far as he can forward, but has to stay within six inches of the guy that called the heroic move. And then everybody else moves after them. And they also have to stay within six inches of both the guy that called the heroic move and the guy that called the heroic march. And I think that's the way that you, that's the way that you have to do it in order to make that work. But kind of, kind of remembering all those restrictions that go with it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, I mean, it's a good point to mention too, Matt, the, the specific order and, and the way you have to, because that might happen in a tournament and someone might go, well, as long as they're within the six inches of this guy, instead of both, then it yeah, might have done. No, the order of moving and all that is mm-hmm. quite important. Actually. I remember one of the previous episodes, we talked about Gothmog and his master of battle, like the order that you do things in mm-hmm. is quite relevant to the game. And I know some people are like sticklers for it when they're not supposed to be. But also, sometimes you have to be a stickler because those do affect the game pretty hard, and it does come into play when you're thinking strategy and like blocking off lanes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, ha- I mean, when you set that up at the beginning of the game for seize the prize, you have to like set up that first turn with mm-hmm. that heroic move, heroic march thing in mind to make sure that you don't like screw up and have a guy who like can get within range of one guy, but not the other and therefore has to stay behind. And then he's like basically out of the fight. Correct me though, if I'm, if I'm wrong, because you've called the heroic march that then heroic move can then still move nine because it doesn't specifically no. say, no. Does it say the heroic march guy has to move first. Well, no. So on the first thing that happens that what the rules mm-hmm. say is the first thing that happens is the heroic guy has to, move and call with me Mm -hmm. at that point the guy who has called the heroic march has not called with me Mm -hmm. so nobody else at that point benefits from it so it's not like uh, it's not like before the turn even starts he's called heroic march no no he says it's an order of operations thing okay he says with me the guy who calls the heroic march says with me when he moves gotcha Mm -hmm. and not before so, I mean, what, what you can actually do if for some reason you need to is you can call the heroic move, move your guy up six inches. And if you want to, you can move other guys before you get to the heroic march guy and they can move their normal move and just end up within six inches of the heroic moving guy. But once the guy calls heroic march and calls with me, uh, then everybody else gets the extra movement bonus, but needs to end up within six inches of both of those mm-hmm. guys. I guess you could try to stack it so that the with me of the move only affects the hero calling march, and then you might get a couple inches off the guys who benefit from the march, but not the move. But yeah, like geom- it's too hard. Geometrically, I don't think yeah. you're ever going to have that situation show up and be able to get a guy yeah. benefiting from the march to step onto the objective, which is where you want it. So, 
All right. Um, thank you for tuning in this week. Uh, let us know as well any lists that you have for future episodes, any uh, ideas you'd like for us to go over, any questions for future Q&A that we'll be doing. And uh, we hope you have a good week. Bye. Thanks, guys.